purpose. <laughs> really funny. <laughs> really funny. Uh, what do you mean I'm funny? <laughs> it's, it's funny, you know. It's a good story. It's funny. You're a funny guy. <laughs> what do you mean? You mean the way I talk? What? It's just, you know, you, it's, you're just funny. It's, you know, the way you tell the story and everything. Funny how? I mean, what's funny about it? Yeah, Tommy, no, you got it all wrong. Oh, 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 Anthony. He's a big boy. He knows what he said. What'd you say? You're right. Funny how? Just, what? Just, you know, you're, you're funny. <laughs> you mean, man, let me understand this, because I don't, you know, maybe it's me, I'm a little <laughs> maybe. But I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you. I make you laugh. I'm here to <laughs> amuse you. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? But not just... You know how you tell a story? What? No, no, I don't know. You said it. How do I know? You said I'm funny. How the f*** am I funny? What the f*** is so funny about me? Tell me. Tell me what's funny. Get the f*** out of here, Tommy. <laughs> you motherfucker. I almost had him. I almost had him. Stuttering, yeah, stuttering prick yet? Frankie, was he shaking? <laughs> I wonder about you sometimes, Henry. You may fold under questioning. <laughs> Ask anyone what they value in a spouse, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, best friends, family, and surely on that list, you're going to find they make me laugh. We love people that make us smile, that keep things light. And if you think about your best managers and you were to make a list, I would venture to guess that they kept things light, made you laugh, and made business seem a little less serious than those that you didn't appreciate as much. But if you look at any resume, when someone highlights their skills, their accomplishments, their special talents, no one ever puts sense of humor as a business skill. And so Frank and I, in this episode, we venture out to figure out, is humor a business skill and we look at when to use humor when not to use humor how to be self-deprecating what's the difference between picking on someone above you versus picking on someone below you the difference between being witty and being a clown we look at the difference between keeping it light in the office and moving over into bullying this is a fun episode and we talk about some of our funniest managers and how they used it as a super skill we hope you enjoy it. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do it. And if you haven't given us a rating, boy, we'd appreciate it. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a uh, hot mic, Sam. You can't say God here. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bitch! How's it going, buddy? I do great. How are you? I'm doing awesome. I hope you're in a cheerful, humorous mood today. I am in a cheerful and humorous mood. Well, that's good because we are talking about the role of humor in someone's career and i think we'll probably focus more on managers that we've known but uh i think we can also look at it from just about any perspective of why business skills typically you know i, I think i think it's worth saying this when you look at any resume when you look at linkedin or an application and people list business skills they list all kinds of soft skills right persuasiveness time management you know ability to be resilient uh, you never see anyone write, I'm funny, right? Or, and I, when I look at it, I, I don't know how you see it, but I really put a high value on people that can make me smile because life's short. And um, I, I find it to be just a very underappreciated skill in business for those who can do it tactfully. Do you, do you remember the first time you realized you were funny? In general or at work? Just in general. No. I remember in ninth grade, I could make a group of people laugh. And in my yearbook, 
many of the people wrote that I was funny. Yeah. And I didn't consider myself funny. I didn't grow up in like a funny house. And my mom and I talked about it. And she was like, I didn't realize you were so funny or so humorous. Or your friends thought that about you. And it was the first time in my life where I really gained a lot of confidence that wasn't around sports. So I had a lot of confidence around sports, but I was always a little socially awkward and a little kind of like, but I remember in ninth grade and ninth grade's hard because you're the youngest kid and like, there's a bunch of other things going on, but I remember that gave me some confidence. And I, I also, as an older person, have looked back and realized like you're often drawn to the people who are funny. And there's a big difference between the goofball class clown in the second grade or the, you know, the goofball class clown in high school. Um, and we'll get into the substance around it. But the person who is like the goofball in high school, that's really a leader has substance. And I think that's what we're going to talk about. Like, what's the difference between like, when can you get away with a joke at work? Well, I think there's different things too. I think, um, you know, I think there's a difference between just being boorish and being witty. And I love witty people that can just come up with a really intelligent twist of words to get you smiling. Uh, witty people are really funny to be around. I mean, I also like hanging around people that tell lots of fart jokes, but that, you know, that's kind of a one trick pony that gets old after a while. The, right. the people who can really twist it around and really come up with creative ways to make you smile. They're fun to be around all the time. I mean, case in point, one of the people in our four man fantasy football league is like the funniest dude we've ever met. And he sends us like the funniest stuff over and over again. And sometimes he's overbearing. Like sometimes a great conversation can be ruined by just constant humor. Yeah. But the upside is there's constant humor and it's usually pretty damn great. The, the upside is you're the number one realtor in Indiana, you know, so that if we're talking about packs here and he's hilarious and he's been hilarious since I've met him in college and he's just a quip a second, but in that line of work where you are constantly meeting new people and you have to make an impression quickly and get very them to like you. And there's no differentiators. All a realtor is really doing is the same thing. They're showing you the listings that are already public and they're negotiating for you. So really his differentiator is he's fun to be around. He's a fun guy to talk to. He's a fun guy to joke with. And he uses it as a superpower that makes him a ton of money. Uh, right. Because if he really comes down to it, you work in a lot of ways. Likeability is important. You and I have spent many, many of these podcasts talking about, you know, bias, recency bias, likeness bias, all of these things. And anybody who makes you laugh is likable. And it's part of the lure that kind of pulls you in. So I'm going to start this podcast with a story. So there, there was a, there was a very heavy time at NVR mortgage. It was just after the financial crisis and Congress put in all kinds of regulations. Dodd-Frank got involved and overnight, almost the amount of administrative effort that went into completing a mortgage tripled. And I'm talking about tripled and we didn't come close to hiring for it. You know, we were still NVR. We were still trying to run nimble and everything. And we started failing audits, state audits, internal audits, left and right. Then corporate would get mad and they would come down on branches. People would quit. Morale went to crap. Um, and we literally burned through a president in about two and a half years. And then he was out. And a new president came in and things even got worse after that. And it not, we had been on a few years of just a bad run of service and running our business. And our CEO really finally, you know, it took him a few years where he finally was like, okay, this isn't just execution. You need resources. And he gave us a lot. He let us build a compliance desk. He gave us more managers. It gave us, uh, we changed our whole staffing model. We paid different um, he pretty much said, you've got everything you need. I don't want to hear about the finance company anymore getting in the way of us selling houses. And so we're in a meeting and he's going around the boardroom table, right? And this is kind of a, it's like our seventh come to Jesus meeting, literally in a year and a half, right? And this was at the nadir. We were in shitsville. It, things were really bad. And no one really knew things were going to get better. We had all these new toys, all these new resources. We had more flexibility than we'd ever had. 
but no one knew when it was going to get better. And he was doing what a CEO does. I've given you a lot of money. I've given you a lot of resources. I need you all to look me in the eyes and tell me when this thing gets better. And so one by one, the regionals went around the table. Normally, I had the biggest region, so normally I spoke first. And I purposely just shut up. I didn't talk because I, part of me was tired of making commitments. Part of me was just like, I need to just go show him results and not say anything. But one by one, the other four regionals go around the table and they hem and they haw and they say, thank you so much for the resources. And we think in another quarter, we're going to start to see good results. And in my head, I'm like, man, this is bullshit. You guys have no, we just, before we even came in here, you guys were saying, we don't know if this is going to work or whatever. So it comes to me and I start by mimicking the way they all started. I was like, you know, Paul, thanks a lot. You know, these extra resources are going to help. The extra managers are going to be great. And I think with a lot of hard work and intelligence, we're going to start seeing some improvements in the next three to four years. And I just paused and like everyone kind of stared at me. And so Phil just busted out and started laughing his ass off because it was so true. Like it had already been a couple of years and nothing had been better. So why was I going to make a commitment that in three months it would be better? It broke all the tension in the room. And then what I said after had some, you know, had some substance after it. But the whole meeting took on a different tenor after that. And part of it was to, to break some of the stress. But the other part was to also remind Paul, no, 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 this isn't going to really happen. Like we've been broke for a while. I'm using humor to try to get you out of your mode of forcing me down on something. We're going to get better. But you asking me for a date is a little silly and premature at this point. And I used humor to do it. And it really worked well. It took a lot of tension off of us. And, you know, we were given time after that to go fix it. It's funny because like, I remember learning in college how to give a presentation and they would tell you like, you know, you, you tell them what you're going to tell them and then you tell them. And then at the end of the presentation, you tell them what you told them. And that is an incredibly boring recipe. Yeah. Now, and what I found always worked for me in like presentations in college or as I got into work is like, nobody really wants to be there and listen to you anyways. So you may as well be at least a little bit entertaining. And how can you possibly be entertaining? Like when I was in college, we had like back in like VCR era, right? But like they used to like tape the economics classes because everyone had to take it. And the two guys would relate like the weirdest themes. Like one was like guns and butter and he was boring. He was an economist. But the thing it taught me was, why relate all the same stuff that everyone hears? Why don't you relate unique things, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, peanut butter and two by fours. Like nobody does that. Like, so it was like a way to infuse a little bit of humor. And then what it got me to is I realized people were paying attention. The other thing I started to do was I started to realize like, you know, what really makes a lot of sense is like, start with a laugh. And what you kind of harness is you realize like, likability, trust. There's a bunch of things that are fostered if you have the confidence to come out of your mouth, something that other people don't have the confidence. And I've been in that corporate boardroom, the same one you're talking about. Like it's a very intimidating place. And the people who we looked up to would giggle, would burp, would fart, would say all kinds of inappropriate stuff because it felt to them like being on our living room couch felt to us because they were comfortable there. And I think what ends up happening, like I'll tell a story about Ian that's flattering for Ian, not as flattering for me. So Ian and I barely know each other. We're both hot shots. In reality, he's one year younger than me and he came from the outside. I had risen up and we've talked in podcasts about like the annual meetings. So I had just gotten promoted to this big vice president's job and I was going to be speaking within like the next 30 minutes. And Ian like completely and totally like lacerated me in a humorous way. And he talked about like how I'd been promoted a bunch of times. I've heard all the stories about this guy. He's been promoted like nine times in five years and he slipped in mostly lateral promotions. And then he did like all this really funny stuff and then he like, he showed like all these great leaders who were leaders in like the eighties and nineties. 
And most of the pictures from, from the early 90s where they all had mustaches. So Ian put a mustache on his face and he turned around. He's like, Frank, the thing you need to be successful around here. And he turns around, he's wearing a freaking mustache. And the place erupted. And what I can tell you is I had to speak right after him. It was very hard to follow. He had a well thought out plan. He had the audience. People were mobbing him to see him and talk to him because he had the confidence to do it. And he had the chops to build a joke that was funny. And it was engaging and everyone loved him. And as we've talked before about how he got invited to all these meetings, because he was smart enough to be able to infuse some humor and make it educational while being fun. And I gave you zero heads up. So you had about two minutes to prepare your retort. It was just an impossible task to follow after that. You I had, had no good, idea I, I was coming after you in that meeting. Do you remember what I said? Yeah, you said something like the 80s called and want your hair back. And then you got trumped by a manager after that who said, I, did, I took a poll and all the girls like Ian's hair or something like that. Yeah. I, you were like, damn it. So, but you know, when, when you... If you take the average person, if you say, what do you love about your wife? What do you like about your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend? Most people are going to say they make me laugh. They make me smile. They make me happy. We say that about our best friends. We say that about our family member that we spend the most time with. So it's really no different at work. You know, what, what are, if you were to ask me, like, who are the favorite people that ever worked for you? I, if I just started spitting names out, they all make me laugh. They were all just funny as hell and they weren't afraid to kind of crack a joke at the right time. My favorite managers made me laugh. I, I'm not gonna list one manager in my top five or six that I've had and I've had 20 some managers that were boring. I, I won't, I, the, every one of them that I would list, they made me better, they weren't just clowns, but they cracked me the hell up. Like one of the best employees I ever had, Frank, you took me all the way to the end, to the very end. <laughs> so he always and, and up. a favorite manager of, of Frank and mine, um, and he's a, he's a dear friend of mine. He's, uh, he, he worked for the company for like 40 years and he, was a, he rose up to be a president, really successful guy, knew his stuff, genius. The company kept him around for his last six to seven years, even though he's trying to retire and paid him just to be around to get involved in big things, like kind of a sage at the top of the mountain. Um, but my first meeting with him, I heard, you know, I'm coming from GE, a very buttoned up corporate world. Brooks Brothers, pleated pants. You got your shit together in a meeting. I'm so prepared. I'm meeting with these two presidents um, and they're both friends. And uh, Kenny and Rainer, a couple of German names. So I'm like, all right, this is gonna be on point. And everyone's like, hey, look, these guys, they can make or break your career. So when you go in there, have it together. So I go in and, you know, we do like a little bit of rapport building. And then out of the blue, Kenny pushes like a report at me and says, what are you going to do about this? And like this report showed us all in the red, you know, my business doing terrible things. And I start to give him, you know, some kind of a coherent, intelligent answer. And as I'm talking, he leans over onto one butt cheek with a smirk on his face and just <laughs> cranks a fart. And I don't know what to do. I like, I don't know what to do. And these guys are both 30 years older than me. I think I was like 28 when I joined there. They had to have been in their late fifties, right? When I joined the company by then. Um, and so I don't know what to do. So I stop and he starts giggling. <laughs> And then I'm like, I think that dude just fucked it. <laughs> and so I pause and I'm like, all right, just keep talking. He's older. Maybe he can't control it. I don't know what to say. So I start getting back into my pitch. And, and literally he does it again, Frank. He leans over again. This one's even louder. And then he goes, God. And he makes a noise. Like, and he goes, uh. and goes what did you eat for lunch? And I'm like, what the hell's going on like these guys are supposed to be two of the highest ranking guys in a publicly traded company and they're cranking fart jokes at me while trying to give a pitch and uh and i i just i learned to realize that that's just the way that guy was wired and everyone had come to accept it and loved him and um and it, it was just scratching the surface of what an oddball character he was for someone that high up into an organization. But what I learned was he also had a lot of substance 
and he was loved like people loved him he could get away with murder because of the love and the substance part he'd hold you accountable he was also he would lacerate you if you screwed something up like he would like there was nobody scarier than him to get yelled at or reprimanded from and there was nobody more that it, less that you wanted to let down but what, what one of the things about this same guy and Ian and I had different exposures to him my like my getting to meet him the first time I ever met him he kind of talked about being a family guy he lived in Florida where I lived and he was trying to build rapport so we talked about it but he talked about like how important his kids were to him and um like he stayed in the Fairfax area because he had two children with special needs and needed to be up close to the hospitals so I like I I saw that side of him first before I saw the other side and then as I was raising up the ranks I just heard how freaking smart this guy was. Like he would be driving down a job site and he would call something out. He'd, he'd be like, what do we got? Like West Virginia molding over there because it was missing a piece of molding. So it was like missing a tooth essentially is what it looked like. So he was like making a terrible joke about something, but he was astute enough to know that it wasn't done right. Even yeah, though yeah. he'd been out of the field for like 30 years. So what you kind of realize is this, and I'm going to back this up with another story in a second, but you realize this. Like if you're going to be the class clown guy in the corporate setting, you got to know your stuff and you can't fake it. Like Ian and I have both hung out with this guy in personal settings. He's exactly the same as he is in the C-suite as he is on the golf course with a cigar or with his friends or his family. So it's, it, it's one of those things. The other side of it is this, like I've got a guy who's through the wall might be able to hear me as I say this, but He's one of the funniest people any of us has ever met. He's got all this energy. He's incredibly likable. Life of every party. And when it's his time to speak, and he's younger, he's in his 20s, that all goes away. Like, if you've got that, know your stuff, know your substance. He and I had a conversation a couple of days ago. I'm like, that has to show. That has to show up. Like, I don't know what it is that's causing you to repress that. But you need to pick those moments and let that out because it is what makes you so incredibly special. Like people would kill to have that. So you like maybe you don't walk into a meeting and fart three times like that. You really got to build up some confidence in a room to get away with that. But the other side of it is if you do have that special talent, figure out how to harness it and utilize it because it's a differentiator. So I think it's worth staying on that because the, my, my mind initially went to, oh man, this guy is a major risk to the organization, right? It, I it, felt he, the same, Ian, he, I felt the same way at a different point. And this is just, home. I'm telling one little story, but he forwarded all kinds of inappropriate emails that were, you know, that could have offended certain people. He said and, crazy things with nicknames, like nicknames that were like, us uh, like offensive his nicknames were hilarious by the way they were hilarious. offensive and but but what was beautiful so hold on hold I, I on think, he used i to think if me. you're listening to this you're probably freaking out and thinking why are they extolling this i think the impressive thing is <laughs> he went 40 some years at this company never a lawsuit never an hr dispute no one ever called corporate on him and i think you know I'm using him as an example because he's a disaster. If you were telling someone what not to do as a manager on a lot of things, he got away with it because he was all heart. People truly loved him and he got away with it because he knew that there was like, there wasn't, if he gave you a nickname, there was never anything mean spirited behind it. And truly you wanted a nickname from Kenny. Like you, I left that meeting I was from then on, I was either slick or, or GQ. I had two nicknames. That's all he called me. And when I talked to Bill Inman, my boss in the, in the um, corporate office, he had, he said how to go. And I told him about the farts and he just started laughing. He goes, yeah, that, that, that's Ken. And he goes, uh, only one question. Did he give you a nickname? I said, yeah. And he goes, he liked you. And I was kind of like, oh, so the meeting went okay. He goes, I'll call him, but I don't think I need to. If he gave you a nickname, he liked you. And that was kind of it. Um, but I was always taken away of this guy is loved by his team that he can get away with some stuff. And by no means do I say you should act the way he did, but he was so heartfelt in the way he led people that no one ever raised their hand and said, you know, someone should do something about this guy. I started off by talking about my first exposure to him was to realize he was just an incredible family guy. And the other thing I said is you got to be true to yourself. Like if you're a fraud and you try and do this stuff, 
it doesn't work. Like you got to be you. But at the same time, like if you are going to, he also knew he was so damn good. He could get away with some stuff. About like, the guy he used to call Sausage. <laughs> so my nickname was Frank the Gay Sam. Cause I used to be, uh, I used to be a, what was called a Sam. A, and he, he called me Frank. Then he called me Flank Steak. Flank Steak and, was my favorite. Yeah, Flank Steak. And he, and he called this one guy Sausage cause he was Italian. And he called another guy, I will, I'll leave his name out, but he called the movie theater head because he had a receding hairline. <laughs> my God, my God. Yeah, uh, Ed Farkas was fungus. Um, like he had a different name for everyone and no one really took it too personal. And, uh, you know, but that was that was part of his shtick. But movie that's theater, part of what we'll talk about is if you're going to get away with that, you got to be authentic and you got to really care about people or you can't act that way or he'd been out long before that for any of that but it's it was a differentiator for him he rose up the ranks he started as a sales rep and worked all the way up to a top 10 executive in the company made a fortune and he used humor as a way everyone loved him people loved him in corporate they loved him in the field they his peers loved him your contractors absolutely loved him he just had a way with people um the way and he used humor as a kind of a superpower and you know it's a way of, we talked about Paxson. So another thing you can use humor with is it's a way to really differentiate in a crowded field. So I use two attorneys. One of the attorneys is the same as one that Frank uses, but really there, you can, attorneys are so replaceable, you know, they, they, they do the same thing. And, um, you know, the price doesn't really matter as much as are they competent, but you can find competent attorneys everywhere. The two that I use, I, Every time I get off the phone, I'm laughing. They crack me up. Their emails are funny. Their voicemails are funny. Our conversations are funny. I'm attracted to these attorneys because they make me laugh and they're memorable, not because they know the law. But they do know the law, both of them incredibly well. But at the same time, you go to them. It, 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 to me, it goes further than the laugh. It goes into, I am not a trained attorney. And I'm closer to a monkey than I am a trained attorney. So what they can do is they can say things in a humorous way that gets my attention. They can also tell a story that's captivating that I can remember. And they can teach lessons through parables or stories or some type of humor, humorous example, which allows me to utilize the knowledge. And they can tell you boring stuff in non-boring ways that's memorable. Well, like one of these, we'll get to it later in the agenda. One of these attorneys, his way of getting points across is to insult you as directly and humorously as he possibly can. And he's very good at it. He can lacerate you in a hurry. And he's great at crushing Frank on a regular basis. He does it a ton. And his last name is Sack. So like, I'll just get a text message from someone on my staff with sack with like seven explanation points, which means there's a really funny email. Most likely I'm the butt of the joke that I have yet to read. <laughs> and he, he will do this with any client, no matter how big they are. He will do that with a fortune 500 company CEO. He does not care. That is his shtick that he, you know, will insult his clients in a very humorous and good spirited kind of way. So, you know, a, an interesting one, but I guess, you know, when, when you think about it, Frank, that you can, you can go too far to the side, you know? So what do you think the difference is between a fun manager and just a clown? The, the fun manager and the clown, I kind of talked about it a minute ago, substance. It's the difference between a class clown in the second grade and a class clown in high school. Our class clown in second grade you don't know what that person does. They don't have their substance. You know nothing. They're just funny or outlandish or loud or something. And you follow them. But that person loses their audience when you start getting into high school because you realize they're probably not going to do much with their lives. But the opposite happens. Like my best friend growing up, Nickel, who we reference here all the time, he was two years younger than people in his classes. And he was still the class clown getting the best grade. And like he would get the entire football team in trouble, the guys older than him, because like he'd be screwing around. They wouldn't be getting good grades and he'd have the highest grade in the class. But what you start to realize is 
really smart people can control the narrative and can control some insecurities or any other things that they might be dealing with because they have a humorous bent in a way to control a narrative. And the faster you get around that and you can kind of understand it and utilize it to your advantage, the better off you're going to be. Ken Glossmacher is like a jock and he uses that humor with a lovable side, with a lot of humor to control the narrative so he can, he, he can steer. And the person who has substance can steer. The person who doesn't is just a clown. So, you know, one of the things that I've found is it's much better to pick fun at someone that's above you on the food chain. So, you know, when, when you you're great it, you're and you're great and you're great at this, like I learned this skill from watching you do it in like annual meetings and things like that. And I've used it in the last decade and a half because it gives you incredible credibility. And you have to be careful. You have to know the person, but if you have like a new manager, a new boss that came in and they're trying to acclimate and, you know, you always have that weird moment, Frank, where there's like some storming going on as a new manager, he wants it his way or she wants it her way. And the team is kind of pushing back because they like some status quo. So there's that, there's that feeling when you're a new manager of you're still an outsider for a while. Um, so we had a, a new president that came in and um, he was always talking about his karate lessons, you know, that he was going for a black belt. Um, and obviously we're all adults and he's older than us. And so we're all thinking like, oh my God, this guy's still talking about belt colors and karate. This is cute. Um, so, but no one ever, you know, he was very serious and no one ever wanted to say anything. So at an annual meeting, finally, like the first annual meeting, we were all straight laced. I didn't do my normal clowning. I just kind of, you know, kept it together, watched, sat back, chilled. Second one, I got to know him a little better. And I knew him a little better at this point than most because I was higher up the food chain. So I interacted with him more often. Most people were still scared to death of him. So out of the blue, I had a slide in there where I talked about what's really going on in his dojo. And I had like a bunch of different like videos of like grown men beating up third graders <laughs> and trying to get belts. And I even had one that had like the same hair, everything. And the place was just roaring. And he was in the back laughing as well. And it, this was interesting. He came and talked to me over beers that night. And he said, you know, I didn't, when you started to do it, I didn't see it coming. And I didn't know how people would react. He's like, but when they started to laugh, it told me that I was one of you. I was now in, I was in like, he's like, and I haven't felt that way. I've kind of felt like the new boss telling him. He's like that moment when you crushed me and everyone felt comfortable enough to laugh at me, made me feel like I was in. He thanked me. He's like, I, I thank you for doing that. Cause that kind of, I feel like that humanized me a little bit. Um, and you gotta like, that is, if I'd have done that too early, it could have went really bad. You know, I, I had to kind of, you have to sense when, do I have the relationship where this person could handle this? Do you, do you see the irony in these stories? Like what you just said about Kenny in this one? No. Like I do. The irony to me is this. Kenny was kind of the kingmaker. If he gave you a nickname, you're in the club. Ian's the young, handsome, talented kid. And if he makes fun of you, you're in the club. And you got to have the chops. You, get, you better have a big enough target on your back. You better be good enough. And like Ian and I became incredibly good friends. He made fun of me right out of the gates because he heard about me. He knew I had a reputation. He knew that I was an up and comer. He knew I could take it. He knew like all of those things. But if, if, if you know how to do this strategically, it can be huge. So I did this my own way and I kind of watched Ian do it in his career. And when I've left my career, what I have found is that the higher up the food chain you get, the less real feedback you get. Like I, I no one, I mean, besides my two-year-old, my wife, I rarely hear if I piss you off or something like that because I, I, I run a business and I don't get the feedback except from a very small group of people. So what I have learned is if you, and you got, you have to be insanely sure you're going to get away with this, or you're going to, you're going to just get laughed out of the room. Or you're going to get, it's not going to go well, but there's a guy that's in my circle. That is just the world's biggest bully. Ian's met him. We've gone to conferences with him. Like he just destroys people and he's never destroyed me. And I have made fun of him ruthlessly. And 
I believe it all balances back to this. He knows I know what I'm talking about. He knows he doesn't need to undress me because it's not going to be effective. If I make a mistake, he'll ask the question or he'll do it in a way that's coaching. And as a, as a return favor, I roast him and it humanizes him, but it's got this weird relationship and it works so well because of that. And it's, does that make sense? I mean, I know you've seen it. I think that's a big reason why I do it as much as I do. Yeah. Um, I'm much harder on people, more powerful than me, more accomplished than me. And part of it is it sends a signal that I don't need them. It sends a signal that I'm confident enough in myself that I'm not sitting around worrying that they might fire me. But just by nature of doing those kind of things, right? Picking on him, you're saying, I don't need to borrow money from you. You bo- The people he bullies are desperately looking to borrow hard money from him. That's what you're talking about. You, you're you saying, eh, I, I like hanging around you, but eh, if you gave me the finger and we never talked again, I'd be fine. I'm, I'm pretty right. confident myself. Yeah, I get it. You're a big, much bigger fish than me, but I don't really give a damn and I'm going to pick on you. And someone like him, when he's used to being around people that are scared of him all the time, he appreciates having someone who will give it to him because you, you get tired of being the emperor with no clothes that everyone says you look fine and everyone just is fighting with each other to agree with you. So it's, you know, I've learned long ago that people up higher up don't have enough people that kind of will crack them every once in a while and they appreciate it. They like it. And that from the CEO down, I would do that to people. And I, I pick my moments. I try to be smart about it and when I did it and and what group I would do it. So let's talk about this. Let's talk for a second about the strategy. Let's just say there is somebody you build a bond with and you think that it might make sense to, to, to utilize this strategy. What I always try is something smaller and non-public and see how it goes. Like before you do a big public show and show the dojo, like you got to know that you have a little bit of a relationship. You got to know the sense of humor. You got to understand what you're treading on and make sure it's not sacred turf. And you got to be very, and and there's very strategic ways that you can do this just through conversations, warming things up and feeling it out. And then you can pounce and have fun with it. But you've got, and the other thing is, is you better be ready to take it back because you might get some in return. And and that's part of the fun. But, but if you do it right, it becomes a very, very pretty ballet. You floated dozens of little cracks to see, do they smile? What's their sense of humor? Do they like those kind of jokes? You know, you kind of keep taking up the temperature a little bit when you go through it, but it's, um, it's an incredibly powerful tool when you use it the right way. And in a court, in a corporate, I'm going to say this too, you know, I'll let you move the next one, but in a corporate setting, if you've got an ally, like a Ken, Hey, what was your meeting like with this guy? Like, Oh, that's a tough fish. That's a tough nut to crack. You know, that you don't want to necessarily pick that guy or you figure out an angle. But it's like, you can also utilize some others who are implementing a similar strategy. Agreed. So gallows humor, this is a um, or dark humor. This is a term that was coined by Sigmund Freud in the twenties. And I like, he wrote a whole paper on this and there's one piece that I pulled out that I'm interested in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote from Freud. A person may behave toward a terrible scenario as an adult does toward a child when he recognizes and smiles at the triviality of interests and sufferings which seem so great. Thus, the humorist would acquire his superiority by assuming the role of the grown up and reducing the other people who are frightened to being children. That's a fascinating thought process around gallows humor. So what he's saying is as an adult, if a kid says, I'm scared, there might be someone in my closet, you kind of giggle at him and you crack a joke, right? To say, come on, kid, I know better than that. But in, you know, when you're dealing with adults, they might say something like, we might go out of business. This is a scary recession. We might go bankrupt, right? And in that moment, cracking a joke, you assume a superior role to them saying, Hey, relax, children. It's not that bad. We can laugh about these kind of things. And I find that a very, I just find that fascinating the way Freud looks at it in a, in an adult child, everything was adult child to him, but um, the way he looks at gallows humor. 
I think you got to be very careful where you apply this if you're in a smaller business. Like if some, like if I was worried about the market and I was saying it was going to tank and somebody, and I'm not an alarmist by nature, and you came back with that. I'd almost, it'd almost be like the Wes Welker thing we talked about, right? Which we'll get into like way to fight for it, way, way to compete. Like you're, you're off base, but if you are in the right setting and like, I, I, I think the really important thing with all of this, you got to pick the right moment and you, it has to be in the right setting. Otherwise it, 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 you, the best joke with the wrong timing can fail and it can fail you and your career spectacular interestingly my funniest stories some of my favorite stories that i tell on this podcast that we talk about whether from ge or nvr or since i've left nvr have been at moments of my highest stress recession that's, that's true ugly scary markets new managers reorganizations where i was scared i was going to lose my job i find that it's innate in some people that when the things get really nuts they can calm everyone down around them by making fun of the situation. So in a, in a great book, The Things They Carried, Tim O'Brien's the author of this, and he's relaying an experience when he first got to Vietnam where there's um, they had to call in an airstrike on a village because they were encountering sniper fire. And after the airstrike, they went down to the village and all that was there, you know, they were expecting to find all these guerrillas and insurgents. All that was there was an old dead man. And he had one of his arms blown off and he was laying on his back with his head up. And he wrote about how each soldier in their unit went up to the old dead man and shook his hand and said, how'd he do? And then the next one would go up and say, how'd he do? And they were all laughing about it. And at first it's kind of, it's kind of gnarly, right? You got a dead dude, but it was kind of their coping mechanism in the war of going from just atrocity to atrocity you know, that's you, you, you hear about that in World War I, how, how many jokes came out of the trenches, how many funny songs that were created in the trenches, people drawing cartoons in the trenches, because how else do you go from day to day of that kind of misery without trying to, gallows humor is just that, cracking jokes when you're about to go to the gallows and get your head cut off, because how the hell else am I going to cope? I mean, I don't think there's anything to say there except exactly. It's it's it, 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 it's a mechanism born through necessity because you have to. What I would tell you though is when you've delivered those points of humor, you've been in a room where it made sense to do it or you understood the temperature or you were the leader and you made the joke because it's a lot funnier if you're the one steering the ship when you say it. And like when something really bad happens around here, I'm usually the first one to break the ice. I'm like, well, you know, that didn't kill us, you know? And like, people feel like, like, I can't believe he's not pissed or flying off the handle. Yep. Like as the leader, you can neutralize a lot of fear through that. But if you're, if you're a subordinate, you got to be very careful. Stephen Colbert has an awesome quote on this. He says, you can't laugh and be afraid at the same time. You just can't. So, you know, he, this was one quote in a larger context around why comedians were so important in 2020, because so many people were afraid and it was terrible. And, and, you know, he came out and said, now more than ever, we need humor because you just can't do the same things at the same time. And I think humor can be distracting. It leaves people just a little less able to focus on the negative information and helps them move on to what we have to do next. Because when you have fear in an organization, Frank, it's really easy to focus on the past and it's really focused to just freeze and quit doing anything. And really what you need a team to do is get over it and move to the next thing we can do right now. And sometimes the best way to get them to move over it is to crack a joke. Agreed completely. Why don't you tell us that funny glass door story? So uh, while while we were in the midst of a lot of that turnover that I started this um, podcast with, we not only were we losing employees, but we had this bad rash where all of them were talking to each other and saying, let's get on Glassdoor. And we really didn't even know much about Glassdoor at the time. We'd never had issues on it before, but 
all of a sudden HR was sending us these glass door reviews and all of us ended up, we all signed up, me and the seven or eight managers on my team, we all signed up for notifications if anything came out from NVR on Glassdoor. And rather than get upset about them, what we started doing is we would read Glassdoor. If you got a review, we all saw it. I would print it and put it first in the packet for our weekly meeting. And we would have the manager who, you know, we'd go around and we'd say, okay, who thinks this is their office? And we'd have them read it out loud to the group. And it was kind of like the mean tweets segment on, um, on Jimmy Kimball or whoever does the mean tweets. It would be hilarious to listen to people read the glass door as if they were the person. But my favorite one, um, and I, I don't think he's going to get too upset about this, NVR, at least our business, wasn't the most diverse business. And we had one Asian manager in our whole company. And he happened to be a good friend of mine and everyone on our team. Um, and so these glass doors were really random, but this one was like, the interview process was a disaster. The Asian manager especially was mean and he had a wrinkly shirt, and <laughs> stinky breath. I can't even say it. And I read it out loud in our group and everyone knows there's only one Asian manager in the company. And I'm like, man, I wonder who they're talking about. <laughs> Everyone just started crying at Devo. And for, you know, three months, every time we'd see him, we'd be like, that's a really nicely pressed shirt. It looks like you've really got your act together every single time. We're getting lean, Ian. We're getting lean. You know, so we turned a terrible situation. Now, it's not like we just ignored it and said Glassdoor is not important to us. We were still focusing on it. And I wasn't really ever focused on Glassdoor. I was focusing on keeping people and making them happier. And every time we'd get one, we'd learn a little bit from it, but we made it funny. We didn't turn it into life or death. We didn't threaten to fire people. We laughed a little bit about the absurdity that is Glassdoor in the first place. There's a movie, what's the movie with the Italian guy where he makes a joke and makes it like his family is living in an incredible place um, during the Holocaust. You remember that? Antonio uh, Antonio Berlini or something like that was his name. It won the, he won the Academy Award for like the best actor. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. All right. So I can look it up later, but the, I thought of it here. There's a song. It's like, if you're going through hell, keep going. Mm -hmm. And some of these times that you're going through like these incredible things in, in the movie that I'm talking about, the man who wins the Academy Award literally walks on top of the chairs to go up to the stage to accept his award because he's just got this incredible personality that will not be contained. And in the, he acts in the movie about the, you know, one of the worst atrocities in the last 200 years, but at the same time he had a family and he had to make it the best he possibly could. So he did. And I think there's two things to say about this specifically at work, no matter what you're living through, the, the earth probably is not going to spin off its axis. Like we're probably all going to live. So the, the, having some humor, levity perspective is, is hugely important. And then number two, unless you want to fire your staff or just be completely miserable, these are the group of people you got to get through it with. So if you can pick up morale in a downtime and you can get people to rally around you, that's how leadership is forged. Look at who have be become leaders in our country, in companies. Like usually it's because of some kind of strife or war or something. And there's just the worst things possibly happening. And then people find others around you. Um, and, and they kind of are drawn to that. So we've talked a little bit about like where, where it's appropriate. So superiors tend to take it better when you pick at them a little bit if you play it right yep. because they, a superior already knows they're above you. So the guy you were talking about that you're picking on that has a lot more money than you, he can't really feel threatened by you. You're right. small fish to him. So Correct. someone who's bigger has more money. Someone, I, a good friend of mine in Vienna, I'm always messing around with, like I'm going to kick your butt. He's like a 270 pound ex defensive end for a division one college football team. He's clearly not threatened by me saying these things to him. Right. right? So I can say it and get away with it. Um, 
I think we talked about gallows humor, which is making fun of a situation. You're making fun of a, an environment. Gall the trench humor is making fun of the war in itself. You're not making fun of anything else. I think another very powerful way of doing it is self-deprecation. There are a lot of good examples of this just with presidential candidates, a, a couple of the famous ones. One was JFK, when he was running for office, was getting a lot of criticism that his rich dad might buy the election. And so at a correspondence to charity dinner, he, in a speech, said, I've just received a wire from dear old dad, and I wanted to read it to you. And he said, dear Jack, don't buy a single vote more than is necessary to win the election. I'll be damned if I'm going to pay for a landslide. So he took something, a rumor that was out there that he was buying it, and he just addressed it head on with a joke. And it dissipated the whole thing. It was over. Because by, by not mentioning it, it gave credence to it. But by making fun of it, everyone reported on it, laughed about it, and it lost its power. And I want to, I want to, before you get to Reagan, I want to interject something. One of our favorite scenes in any movie we share this collectively is Eminem and Eight Mile. And what does he do? Tell these people something they don't know about me. He gives them everything. Yep. Every bad piece of information. Now, now he renders the crowd speechless or his competition speechless. Oh, yeah, the it's, crowd laughing too, because he's making- The crowd's his, laughing, his, his but your ass, competition yeah. can say nothing because of the fact you just like, you took away all their bullets. So if yep. you have the self-confidence and the aptitude and the ability to just pay attention and understand, if you're not obtuse, you don't take yourself too seriously, this is when self-depreciation works incredible. But it, but you can use it in so many ways. I'll let you get into Reagan and then we can tell some stories. So Reagan was 73 when he ran for president in 1984 and he was running against Mondale. And so Mondale's approach was obviously he's too old to be president. He's losing his mind, doesn't have his faculties. He was a great man. He no longer is. He's not sharp enough to do it. Um, and uh, it got brought up at a debate and Reagan's quote was amazing. It was, I refuse to make age an issue in this election. I won't exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. And so he completely flipped something. And, and not, not only did he flip it and turn his weakness into a strength that he was more experienced and Mondale was inexperienced, what he also did was he showed America, I'm quick-witted enough and smart enough at 73 to outwit my opponent with a funnier joke. And it was more memorable. That wouldn't have been as memorable if it wouldn't have been funny, but it made everyone there laugh. It made Mondale break out and start laughing. It was funny. It was like a laugh out loud kind of a joke. And in case you're not a historian or you don't know this stuff, you're not paying attention to it, you've forgotten. In 1984, Reagan ended up winning by one of the largest margins in the last 70 years. Um, and he was beloved. And I was eight or nine while all this was happening. But that happened at the second debate, the second presidential debate. And Reagan got his ass kicked in the first one. There's a series of documentaries that are out now that kind of go through the second presidency. And I've just recently watched it of Reagan. He got trounced, like absolutely trounced. He didn't prepare. Mondale murdered him. And the one thing that he knew that he could overcome with humor was this. In that same debate, in that same debate, he gave up the fact that we had Contras <laughs> in, 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 in Panama. Like he literally gave away secret information, but he was so likable. He was so compelling. He was so incredible in that moment. Like he went viral before you could go viral. Mm -hmm. And because he did that, he overcame a crappy first debate, giving up the fact that we had top secret information being shared. And he won the whole election right there. I love it. It's a mic drop. So I saw this uh, with a vice president once at a meeting where his, his division was known for profits. Uh, and they were very good at it, very good at sales, profits, all these things. But our, our leadership of our company was trying to get the company to focus on um, efficiencies, administrative stuff. And so a lot of the big trophies that year were based on things that traditionally his team was not good at. And so this big award came out to another division, not him, 
where they were recognized for a certain number of homes sold with zero change orders, right? So that's an efficiency thing. And you understand all of that, Frank, that it's less paperwork, easier on the office, we can run with less people. And so he got up there and, you know, it, his, his lead entry was congratulations to the division, you know, with that many sales with zero change orders. And it was like 23 homes with zero change orders. And he said, I'm excited to say that last weekend, just last weekend, we signed one contract with 23 change orders. And the whole place fell out laughing, including our CEO. He couldn't stop laughing about it. And it was our CEO that was driving some of these changes in the organization. But in just a really sly, that, that, that's the difference between second grade humor and the class clown who's witty in high school. It was witty as hell. He twisted a number a little bit and he diffused the fact that his division had not completely yet bought in to a new initiative and reminded everyone I'm still pretty good at a few other things, which I, I just thought was awesome. Yeah, and it's one of the things that you notice in people who are incredible. Like you get a comedian who gets up on stage and it's beautiful to watch. Like it is very choreographed and you know, like they've worked their asses off in the clubs to get to the arenas, right? But you watch that person who does improv, who literally makes things up on the fly. And that's a completely different skill set. Yeah, but if yeah. you can utilize that to just some degree of success in your life and your career and to add levity, and if you do it at your own detriment, it always works. Like when you point out your shortcomings against someone else's successes, it humanizes you. And it immediately makes the crowd think this person is confident enough to realize they have a shortcoming. They're not, a, they're not running from it. And that's what true leadership is. Like true leadership isn't you're always Superman. True leadership is looking at like, yeah, I kind of suck there, taking it honestly and being able to say, it's time for us to pivot away. And you're right. We have been slow to do so, but we're now willing to do it. I hear you. So there was a study on this um, where um, they studied interviewers and job applicants. And uh, those with a limited math background had two answers that they gave. One gave a standard answer where they just said, I'm not good at addition, subtraction, or geometry. But the other one said, I'm fine with addition and subtraction, but geometry is where I draw the line. And it's a funny kind of a line and it would get a laugh out of the interviewer. But what came out of it was the interviewers thought much more highly of the math skills of the people that used it as a quip. This reminds me of our peak end theory podcast. The person who had the probe just stuck in their ass for three extra minutes. Thought it was as long as it doesn't bad. wiggle. You just don't want it wiggling, Frank. <laughs> you just don't want it wiggling. So I, you know, a way that I do this with self-deprecating is one of my favorite lines to use is whose dumb idea was this anyway? Um, and I only, I only do it when it was my idea. So let's say I've been pounding some initiative for a year and we're all starting to realize that there's some bad unintended consequences that came from my idea. I love to just, we'll be talking about, I'd be like, who the hell stupid idea was it to measure this anyway? And it kind of gets everyone to laugh a little bit. It diffuses the room a little. And what it also does is it gets your team comfortable with giving you more feedback of saying, well, actually, now that we're talking about it, it's worse than we even thought it was. So you can get that good feedback by self deck by saying, I'm not afraid to criticize myself in a humorous way, I think you should all feel just as comfortable picking on me as well. I think this can be successfully used in, in many different facets of business and life. You can use it at work. You can use it at home. A two-year-old that can't pick up subtlety, it's not going to work with. But it certainly works with my wife. Anytime I make fun of myself, it's always welcomed. But the other thing that I learned about self-deprecating humor is this. Whenever I would speak publicly, and, I, and I, I used to get very nervous to be in front of a room, I would always say something in the first like 90 seconds that was either really funny or made fun of me and was funny. Because if I did it, I was humanizing myself to the crowd. Yep. I got a laugh, so I'm in control. And I would get a brief pause that allowed me to just breathe. So I would always do something like that, that made fun of some, like usually me. 
And it would just, it would give me 30 seconds to just breathe, shut my microphone off, calm down, and then take on my info. And if I ever get into a stumble in, in a presentation where I'm in front of a crowd and I speak in front of on stages all the time, I always go back to it, even as a reset. That was dumb. How the hell did I screw that? But it's like one of these things that yeah. it, it's, it's almost like you're asking for, hey, I need a moment of grace without saying it. And it just works so incredibly well when, 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 you, when you can use that to your advantage. And I've just seen, I've seen a lot of people survive in companies for long periods of time without performing because they were liked and because they kind of owned the fact that they weren't performing. It wasn't that they weren't trying, but they just, they were liked, they were kind of funny about it and they were honest about it. And um, to, to kind of demonstrate this, one of my absolute favorite coaches of all time is, was not a good one in the NFL, but he was great in college. So John McKay. Let's talk, let's talk about this for a little bit, right? So like in preparation for this, he and I are going through this, we're going through the agenda. I remember all these things, but this is like 40 something years ago. And like in reading this, we're both in hysterics. Like we've all heard this. We know the stories. We know all of these things. We've seen Chris Berman do them a hundred times. And even so you come back and you read it and you're like, these are just incredible. So John McKay, he's a hall of fame college football coach. He won the Rose bowl five times, nine conference titles at, at USC uh, with the Trojans, like 127 wins and 40 losses. So he leaves after this brilliant career um, to go form the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So he's going to be their first coach, expansion team. Clearly, they're going to suck. No one has high expectations early. Um, he loses his first 26 games, um, but he keeps his job for nine years. And his, his win-loss record at the end of it was 44 wins and 88 losses. He's the losingest coach ever. There's like that range. No coach ever makes it that long, losing that long. And part of the reason was he was loved by the media, by owners, by the fans, because he could just turn it into a joke. So he, some of his best quotes. So a reporter asked him about his team's execution and he said, I'm all for it. Um, he had another one. I told my team after the game, there's 750 million people in China who don't even know this game was played. Then the next day, a guy from China called and asked, what happened, coach? Um, he said, it's good to have a dog because when you, when you stink it up on the field, you come home and they're always your friend. But when I lost to Notre Dame 51 nothing, my dog bit me. Well, we didn't block, but we made up for it by not tackling. <laughs> He was asked about his defense and he said, we can't stop the pass or the run. Otherwise we're in great shape. And so th those are, if you just Google John McKay, there's, there's 50, 60 quips just like this. So the guy was just always funny, always entertaining. And he did have a few winning seasons mixed in. So, but he was given a really long leash and a long time of not performing where they, he was one of the highest paid guys in the league. When he took Tampa's job, they paid him 2 million bucks. That was insane at the time to lure away a hall of famer to get him there. So for nine years, he's one of the highest paid guys in his field losing all the time, but he showed confidence by doing this. He seemed more trustworthy. He was more likable and people gave him a birth versus a guy who just ran the lions, Matt Patricia, who was just obstinate, fought with the press, never smiled, didn't crack a joke and had no resume to speak of when he got there. And, and just tried to take a hard ass approach. The media hated him, which meant the fans started to hate him really quick. And the ownership had no choice but to go and get rid of him. And a lot of it was, he just had no sense of humor about anything. He was not a likable guy. I think he could have bought himself another year or two if he would have just been more self-deprecating and had a little bit more fun in how he handled his team and, and the media. It's easier to be self-deprecating if you believe it. And we all believe it more when we're younger or we're less successful or before the big job or before we marry the pretty girl or whatever, however you measure the success. And what I find incredibly fascinating about a John McKay is with incredible resume, 
like USC is like the 33rd, you know, NFL franchise at certain points in time. Like he's in Southern California, the, like in my opinion, like the best place on earth. And, but he never took himself too seriously. And he was a serious person, but he also joked enough about it and said, look, I know this sucks. I'm not afraid to tell you it sucks, but he didn't do it in a Belichickian or like an Urban Meyer way. He did it with an incredible amount of competence, yet humor and depreciation and, and, and self-reflective depreciation, um, like tearing himself down. And why, why is that important? As you get higher and higher on the mountaintop, you lose sight of the fact that you still need to do this. You need to do it more when you're up top then you need to do it less. You need to, because it grounds you and makes you more relatable and keeps you in the know and keeps you relevant. And I, I, I think it's hysterical when a Patricia who has no real resume to speak of is just like, there's several Patriot assistants that have done this. They've moved to the NFL, become head coaches, and they are just brash and arrogant. Great. You are brash and arrogant underneath the best coach in history with a quarterback who's won more Super Bowls than any NFL franchise. Like you, th this is not the moment to be brash and arrogant. This is the moment to be humble and to be incredibly appreciative. And it's a flip of what you usually see, which is so cool about it. So the last one we're going to talk about is when to use humor is just when delivering difficult feedback. Um, so we'll go to another president, um, Lincoln, during the Civil War, he was upset with General McClellan because uh, McClellan just would never, he would never attack Lee. He just would kind of keep finding reasons why they didn't have enough resources or the, the terrain wasn't enough. And so he sent him a letter that said, General McClellan, if you don't want to use my army, I should like to borrow it for a while, which I just think is one of the all time zings. And he's using humor to because he had already written enough letters that said attack, approach them, engage, same thing over and over. And so to get his attention, he used a quip. Um, and it, um, it got us thinking about a more modern one of using a sports analogy. So Wes Welker was one of the great wide receivers for the New England Patriots of all time. And he was also a punt returner. But towards the end of his tenure, um, he had to miss a game and it was because he was feeling sick. He wasn't feeling good. So he was a scratch. He was in civilian clothes. And the rookie on the team, Julian Edelman, who's now become a many time over pro bowler, got a chance to fill in for him. And he returned a punt for a touchdown in that game. And Belichick gets on his, his headphone up to the top and says, hey, who was the guy that Played, uh, played before Lou Gehrig, went on a streak. Wally Pip, that's it. And he goes over to Wes Welker and he says, hey, Welker, you know who played, uh, you know who played in the infield before Lou Gehrig? And Welker doesn't understand the joke. And he goes, Wally Pip. Wally Pip was the guy before. And then he missed a game. Lou Gehrig didn't come out for like 20 years. And he's making a point to Welker that you didn't show up today and this rookie's about to take your job. Uh, and what does Welker say to him? He goes, he can have it. And how does Belichick respond to that? Way to compete. Way to compete. Way to compete, Wes. But uh, interestingly enough, he was trying he was to get a point across, trying to use some humor, using the old Wally Pip joke. Uh, interestingly, though, Welker was gone the next year, and Edelman was the starting wide receiver because uh, Welker didn't take that nudge. And part of the reason he'd take that nudge, Peter McGraw, he ran a bunch of experiments and found that when giving negative feedback, if you're using humor, it's received better overall, but it can also be seen as less serious or benign um, and recipients feel less compelled to take action. And so my takeaway from this, Frank, is if you're going to use humor to deliver difficult feedback, um, know the person well and know that, that that's going to land in some way. Um, and I, I like to use it like as an early reminder or just a little nudge of, hey, I'm paying attention. This isn't like a sit down, I'm having negative feedback with you. It's just uh, maybe it's effort, maybe it's something else, but I might use a little bit of humor just to let you know I'm still paying attention. Different scenarios. When I watched the Belichick Wally Pip thing, it made me kind of realize that Wes Walker isn't too smart. 
He either isn't smart, he wasn't paying attention or some combination of both because he just didn't get it. So if you're going to use humor, you got to have someone who is willing and able to comprehend and listen. The second part of using humor to give bad news, I usually use it when I'm kind of tired of using normal approach. And like, it's my last or second to last or maybe third to last ditch effort of, we're just gonna let you go. So it's one of those things where you might've earned it. Or if you're smart enough, you realize, wow, this is really, I, I, I can't even get a straight approach anymore because I just, I, I just not earning it. Mm. So, and I'm the opposite of most people. Like I come off, I'm told I'm blunt or straight to the point or no beating around the bush. So when I go to humor, like in these serious moments, it, it's like, I'm about to just do this and throw my hands up. So you got to be very careful if that happens. Yeah. I, you know, I would do things sometimes where if there was someone who worked at our company who was kind of infamous for doing something knuckleheaded and they no longer worked at our company, I would start to call someone that name, just picking at them a little bit, you know, like the old McGillicuddy. If McGillicuddy was a knucklehead and never and always missed deadlines, and I had a manager who wasn't like that, but all of a sudden was missing deadlines all the time. I'd start to just call him McGillicuddy and act like it was a Freudian slip. Like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I meant, I meant Mike. Sorry. I, I missed that. You know, so where you would cut in, if they're the right person in the right temperament, they get it. It lands. They get what you're saying. It changes. You can stop with that little poke, but it's for me, if you're going to use it, 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 I think more than any way of using humor, it can really, it can really, th- giving difficult feedback. If you're not great at this, I would avoid it. Uh, Cause I think most people would probably screw it up. I, I think as a new man, like you're either great at this or you, you can grow into it. But if you don't think you can pull this off, you're better off, especially with this, you just go straight ahead. But you do get to a point in your life, in your career, or you're like, this is serious, but it requires it's almost like you're joking with yourself because you're just so pissed that you're there. And it, it's like, I really got to go through this again with you. Like really? Or like it, let's just say you have a star performer who does one dumb things like, like you'll hear in like um, in like in football, they'll call someone butterfingers, like clearly not butterfingers. If you're playing wide receiver in the NFL, but they call you butterfingers, which means you can't catch the ball because you dropped a couple of key passes and you're just too damn good for that. Like, I feel like that's the time to use the humor because most of us don't have Lincoln's command of the English language. But if it's a real performance thing, attack it straight ahead. So I, I think we can summarize this all up. I think if you're going to use it, use it on yourself, self-deprecation, use it for the scenario, pick on the scenario, pick on the market, pick on what whatever find a villain you're all up against and make fun of that part of the situation. Be very careful doing it down. Use it more up the chain than down the chain. If it's out of your character, if you're not funny in your personal life, you likely just won't be funny at work. You're not gonna become magically funny. If you're not able to quip at home or with your friends or with your family, you're not gonna be really good at it at work. But on the other side, like Frank said, if you are really good at it in your personal life, don't hide it. It's a superpower of yours, use it. Let that part of your personality flourish a little bit more. Be careful if you don't have relationships, making jokes at someone else's expense. Be careful with inside jokes that you could alienate people if you don't make them in on it. So going back to Kenny, everyone had a nickname. He didn't just give nicknames to his 10 favorite people. He found a way to give everyone a nickname so everyone felt inclusive. Be careful, I think, with locker room humor. You know, it can ruin your brand. It can just come across as low EQ. Um, and, um, you know, it, same with the presentation. If you're not very good at leading with a joke, don't lead with a joke. If that stresses you out so much, of the, the prospect of telling a joke in front of a group of people in a presentation, don't do it because you're going to be stressed and you're probably going to bobble it. Those are my takeaways for a summary. 
what I would summarize this entire episode is this. Understand who you are and what your superpowers are. We all have them. Some people just spend a lot of their life trying to find them. But if you can be honest and you are a funny person, use it. Pick the right times, use it at the right moments. A superpower overuse can still not, it, it can be no longer be a superpower. But if you use what you do have appropriately, efficiently, and effectively, it can make you incredibly hard to overlook, an incredible communicator, or someone who is very, very, very compelling to follow. And that's it. But if humor isn't it, find your other superpower and cor corral them the same way that we've talked about doing it with humor. And, and don't equate humor to not being serious. Uh, I think a lot of people don't want to show that you, your guy, if I were giving him advice, the guy that's behind the wall there that you just said is really funny, but doesn't bring it to work in his mind, he thinks that if he shows people he's funny at work, people won't take him serious. And I'm just here to say that that's completely inaccurate. Even senior executives like to laugh, like to be around people that make them smile, that can lighten the mood. I've seen people that are incredibly wealthy use humor on a daily basis at work and they were fun to work for and people stayed with them because they let that part of their personality shine. My last point of summary is this, we've talked about this before in prior podcasts. Who are you taking advice from? Who's telling you not to be funny at work? Who are you really listening to? E and I have both managed huge teams, built businesses, and we love humorous people if they've got the chops. 100%. And uh, you got the chops, homie. Flank steak. That's, that's your chop right there, big boy. We both dressed up for the occasion. Ian wore an Average Joe's t-shirt, which is a reference, I believe, to the uh, dodgeball, right? Patches yeah. O'Houlihan, homie. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it.